I'm a 17-year-old high school guy with a weak body. I live in a small town in the Philippines, and this town is surrounded by rice fields with a highway going straight across it. Part of my usual weekend routine is to go jogging early in the morning, sometime around 5 a.m. My usual jogging route is from my house, somewhere in the middle of town, to a small hill with a wonderful view of the town in the morning. To reach my destination, I would have to jog on the side of the highway. From time to time, a fog that lasts about an hour would appear on the highway, and once you're inside of it, you could see only about 10 or 15 feet before it all goes white. So one Saturday, I decided to jog. I invited one of my friends to join me since he follows the same route anyway. We left home at 5 a.m. and proceeded to the highway. As usual, a thick fog blanketed the highway. The cars that would pass had their lights on, and there were several one-ways because of the road repairs. As we entered the fog, we decided to jog along the side of the road and pass a couple of roadworks. All was well at that point, a bit exhausted, but otherwise fine. We barely encountered anybody else, and usually they're just fellow joggers too. Then we came across another roadwork, and we saw this guy crouched down on the asphalt. He was wearing a dirty orange vest, and similarly dirty hard hat. We couldn't see his face, but we decided to ignore it. He looked as if he was fidgeting with something in his hands, so we thought he was just holding a few tools or something. Also, there was nobody there but us, myself, my friend, and that guy. The fog was still thick as hell. My friend signaled me to keep a distance from the guy, and I followed him. When we got closer, we heard him humming a strange tune under his breath, which in itself wasn't that weird. But boy, were we wrong. As we got closer and closer to the guy, he started acting erratically. He stopped for a moment as I passed him. Then he started laughing. It wasn't a regular laugh. And it sounded sinister and a little dry. It was pretty loud, so it really freaked us out. We didn't increase our speed at that point, as we thought he was just toying with us. But he didn't stop. He just kept laughing and laughing, and we knew it was beyond a prank. I can't describe his laugh more than I just did, but trust me, he wasn't faking it. We didn't look back. We were speeding up now as we were starting to see the hill. I was gasping for air, but I didn't know what would happen if I stopped. I just forced myself to keep running and running, and my friend did the same. He was probably 50 meters behind us when I decided to look at him. He had stopped laughing, but now he was standing straight and was glaring at us. He called out to us in an enraged tone. That's when the adrenaline kicked in. We just ran and ran until we reached the hill. In hindsight, I don't know how I was able to push myself that far for so long. When we finally reached the top of the hill, we were exhausted. I nearly collapsed on a cement bench and stayed there for another hour. Like a breath of fresh air, my friend laughed in a more comedic manner, and I followed suit. We laughed the whole thing off while waiting for the fog to lift. When it did, we walked home. I hadn't had breakfast yet, so I was pretty hungry. As we passed the roadworks where we saw the guy, he was no longer there. The only people that were wearing construction outfits were the ones signaling the traffic, but none looked like the man we saw. As I got home, I told my parents what happened, and they said it was probably just another nut job that stole a construction outfit. Since then, I've never gone jogging into a fog again. Thanks for reading. And highway guy, let's not meet ever. So this was quite a while ago. I was I'd say about 11 or 12 when this happened. One night, my mom and I had decided to get food from a pizza place around us that was close, but not close enough that they would deliver to us. The trip there was fine. We got our food and were on our way home 
when we decided to stop at a gas station. When leaving the gas station, a dark burgundy car pulled out behind us. At first, obviously, this didn't raise any red flags, but as we kept going and getting closer to home, this car was still following us and we were starting to get freaked out. It followed us the whole way home. Once we got home, we pulled in and this car just stopped in the middle of the road a bit behind us. My mom told me not to get out of the car. We sat there for about 10 minutes until finally the car decided to drive past us. I was so scared I didn't look at the car. I didn't want to see who was in it. They turned at the next block. My mom told me to get out of the car and to run to the house as fast as I could because she was worried they were just going to drive around the block. We got out, ran to the house, and locked the door. I don't know if they ever came back and I never saw that car again. It was one of the creepiest things to ever happen to us. So, I think it was around 2018 to 2019 when this happened. I don't really remember the year but I remember everything leading up to the moment in vivid detail. I used to live on a farm for a few years. I moved away a while ago, but one day my aunt was going to take the people who worked on the farm back home, as they didn't live there, and she asked me if I wanted to come with. I said yes. About 30 minutes before we went, I saw a figure in the kitchen doorway. It was crouched down on all fours, almost in an animalistic way. I couldn't make out any facial features or anything. I only know it had an almost feminine build. Long black hair, black eyes that I could only see the glints in the dark of, and deer antlers protruding from its head. After that, I was obviously freaked out, but fast forward to after we dropped the workers off at their houses, we were on our way back home, and I swear, I saw something crawl across the road before the pickup truck we were in flipped and rolled. Luckily, neither of us were seriously hurt in that accident. Neither of us sustained long-term injuries that were going to cause us problems later in life, but it traumatized the hell out of me. Can anyone maybe give an explanation of what I saw that day? I have been looking for answers ever since. This happened years ago when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week. And we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive, and I had a 10-year-old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up, but it still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up, so they offered me a deal. I would stop at every rest stop every 2-3 to three hours to stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within the three-hour window, though, they would assume I'd been in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audio or podcast they knew I would have on. I accepted the deal, and that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 a.m. This was actually one of the nicer stops, well-lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them. The payphone wasn't broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple of cars there with people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. 
Miss, can I ask you a favor? I turned around, and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked, but there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked to be in his forties. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was too close, but his body language wasn't screaming, threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 feet, and at that point in my life, 110 pounds soaking wet, and even though I had already binged on a lot of true crime media, and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out-of-state license plate, my dumb ass asked what he needs. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck, and if he could just borrow my phone real quick to call his friend, it would just take a second and it would really help him out. And I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him with a Pollyanna, no problem. And then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit, and this guy looked really normal. Except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney, actress in a Glade commercial who's trying to convince us she's in love with a dumbass who doesn't know how air fresheners work eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. So I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my god, I'm so sorry, but I don't have a charger. I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone. And I need that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now. But good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet away. And he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me. And now, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car, because he creeped me out and he has a serial killer face, so going to the bathroom is out. But I also wanted to get away from him, prove I'm not gonna help, and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get into the car, but I would have to get really close to him unless I crawled over my passenger side seat and he's not moving, so I did the first thing that popped into my mind. I called my dad, and my dad, for the first time that night, did not pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He was just staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my dad. I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I'd hung up the phone and loudly said I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality, I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was, and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple visible security cameras. The guy still hadn't moved, and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I've thought of a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out, and my mind went blank. So I hung up and didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a little bit. At this point, he's been leaning against my car, staring at me for at least ten minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men sleeping in their parked cars and asking them for help. And just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me to get into my own damn car annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and headed back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call his friend to bring the spare keys. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he's been creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. 
I almost pointed out the working payphone just in case I'm wrong about this and I was being a bitch to a guy who needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in and I lost all nerve and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on. I was so focused on getting away from him. And then, halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom, who would freak out if I don't pick up and who was already sick and I needed to put on my seatbelt. I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I was parked with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone but I kept my engine running and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her everything's fine. Where I was, my ETA. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I overreacted. She scolds me about speeding and I tune her out because the guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watched the guy cross to a truck, unlock the door, and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seemed to be an issue for him. I watched the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I didn't speed. I did not want to see that truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking and that girls who look like they don't live nearby or maybe look like they're living out of their cars tend to be targets. I don't know if that was what was happening or if he was just trying to scare me into handing over my phone. Either way, creepy guy at the rest stop, let's not meet again. When I lived in Madison, Wisconsin, I lived across the street from Camp Randall, the football stadium. On game days, they'd shut our street down and people would flood it, drinking and partying. We'd sit on our porch and drink beers and Bloody Marys with the crowd at nine in the morning. Good times. But one day, there was this girl walking briskly up the sidewalk, sobbing, makeup smeared all over her face. She was covered in dirt like she'd been rolling around in it, head to toe. She didn't look beaten or anything that might have suggested a brawl, just covered in dirt. And the thing was, she was dressed for game day, all decked out in her Bucky Badger stuff, and she had her hair up in little buns. Whatever happened to her had just happened, and given that she was, despite her condition, a very attractive girl. Our minds went to the worst place, that she'd been sexually assaulted. I lived in a big house with seven guys and a girl. At the time, it was just the guys on the porch, and given what we feared might have happened, we called for our female roommate to see if the girl needed help. The girl just shook her head, said I'm fine, and kept walking. It's not as creepy as other stories, but still... Given the situation, the sight of the girl, it's hard to think she wasn't assaulted. I still think of her when I think of my time at that house. This seems like the right place to tell this story. It happened back in 2013. It was about 8 or 9 o'clock and I was on my way home from a pals. I was sat upstairs at the back of the bus. There was only me and one other person on the top floor of the bus and he was sat near the front on the opposite side. When I got up to get off the bus and walked from the back towards the stairs, he called me. I don't remember exactly how he asked, but he was asking for a lighter. I walked up to him going through my pockets and told him I had matches and handed them to him. He took them from me 
and just stared at them for a good few seconds and then handed them back to me and said something along the line of, don't worry. The time it took him to decide not to use them felt very strange and the eye contact before and after just felt intense. I walked down the stairs thinking what the hell was up with that and then got off the bus. I told a couple of people how weird it felt and described what he was wearing. A zip-up black hoodie with a knockoff Hardy-style tiger on the chest. Fast forward about a week and there's a fatal stabbing on a bus in my city. A young girl on her way to school was stabbed to death on the top deck of a bus. Stabbings are pretty common in my city, but a young girl being killed on her way to school, that's big news anywhere. They showed a photo of the suspect being arrested, but you can only see the back of his hoodie. Straight away, I think that's the exact same Ed Hardy knockoff, and start wondering if it's the guy I had seen. When they released more photos of him from the front, I knew it was him. The scary thing is, when it transpired, he had recently been let out of a mental health facility. He hadn't been given any support and had been sleeping rough on buses. I've had many interactions with mentally ill people and dangerous individuals, but this one is the one that stays with me. Even though the interaction wasn't much, it felt so strange. I always wonder if he was seeing how I reacted when he asked me, hence why he didn't use the matches. Who knows, it's just a sad story really. Rest in peace to the poor girl who was murdered. Her name was Christina Edkins. She was just 16 years old. A man knocked on my apartment door because he thought I was a prostitute. I live in an apartment building, and I guess there was a girl with a similar name to mine with long brown hair who moved in, and she was doing dates at her apartment through the internet. He thought I was her and followed me to my apartment. He said he went down to look at the register in the lobby and saw my name, and our names were really similar. Think Kristen and Christine or Brianna and Brianne. Anyway, he followed me like I said, and then looked at the registry downstairs and just assumed I was this woman. So he knocks on my door. I answer it and he tells me it's his birthday. Now, keep in mind, I have no idea about any of this. And so I say, oh, okay, happy birthday. So then he says that he would give me $60 to go and hang out with him and his friends and that if I wanted to party, he would supply it for me, and that he and his friends would pay me for anything extra. I was completely confused. I said, What do you mean? What are you talking about? I don't want to go to your birthday party. I don't know you. To which he replied, Well, I saw your ad on the internet and replied, and you gave this address, and I saw you, and blah, blah, blah. He tells me the story like I described in the beginning of this post. I said, no, that's not me. I am not a prostitute. It was really strange and creepy. I was still somewhat perplexed by this until I told a neighbor a few months later. And apparently, this woman got booted from the building because of the traffic to her apartment. I'm glad the management didn't get us confused as we live on different floors. The complaints of traffic were specific to her apartment. Thank goodness. This happened when I was 17. I was walking home from a party and it was pretty late, probably around 4.30 to 5 a.m., one of my guy friends had decided to walk me home since he didn't want me to walk alone so late. The streets were empty and it was pitch black. As we are walking and chatting, we notice that a man is walking up to us. When he approaches us, he starts saying over and over again, Hey, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy, I promise. He didn't seem threatening and I remember that I didn't feel scared. Maybe because I was with my friend, who is an athletic person. 
So this guy starts asking us for money to buy a sandwich and tells us that he can't return home until 10 a.m. because his neighbor has a restraining order against him. Apparently, the neighbor leaves for work at that hour. At that point, we were like, what the fuck is going on? We decided to give him some money so he would leave us alone. We gave him around 5 euros, which is more than enough to buy a sandwich. We then lied and told him that's all we had. Then, this man looks at me and says, No, that's not true. You have more money in your wallet. I can see it from here. At that point, I just put my wallet back into my purse and told him I couldn't give him more money. As we were walking away from this man, he once again catches up to us and says, Why don't you guys come with me to try and find a vending machine? And that way you make sure I'm not spending your money on drugs. I don't exactly remember what we told him, but there was no way we were going anywhere with him. Even though I didn't feel scared or threatened at that moment, in hindsight, it was kind of creepy. I'm just glad my friend insisted on walking me home. Was he just desperate for money, or did he have other intentions? Hi everyone, this situation has been ongoing for many, many months, and I'm interested to hear others' perception and any possible advice. I have lived in my apartment complex since 2021, it's a pretty big place with lots of buildings, lots of people, and lots of dogs. I have a dog myself who is unfortunately reactive. I generally just keep to myself when walking her and pivot if we see someone walking towards us. Many months ago, I started seeing this guy show up at the same time I walked my dog. He would be walking to the dog park on the far back entrance. He sees how my dog is and makes no attempt to give us space. In fact, there are times where he even gets closer to us. This has happened for months. I begin to think maybe he's just dense, unaware or whatever, and think maybe he's just trying to let his dog play early in the morning before work. So I start taking my dog out 30 minutes earlier. He starts coming out at the same time too, 30 minutes earlier. Again, he does not try to avoid me even when I'm actively trying to get away from him. He has never said a word to me. He's constantly showing up right after I leave no matter what time or how often I deviate from my schedule. The other day, I was out with my mom walking my dog, and we see him across the parking lot walking towards us. He has always expected me to move out of the way even though I'm there first. Plus, my dog is going to the bathroom, so I can't move. He walks like two feet to the right of us, so of course my dog is going ballistic. My mom noticed too, and said that's weird. Well, tonight it happened again. I said screw it, I will move out of his way because I don't want to deal with the headache. So I move off the sidewalk and walk next to this fence, keeping my dog on a tight leash because she's freaking out, as we're almost right next to each other, but several feet apart. I look over and see he's kind of behind me and still walking towards the park. I get back on the sidewalk and my dog suddenly jumps behind me in a protective stance. I turn around and this man was standing less than 10 feet behind me, facing me and staring, not saying a word. What are your thoughts? And how should I address this creepy neighbor? I was working at a mobile late one night in my hometown, which is a summer vacation hotspot, when I saw a middle-aged man who looked like he just walked off the golf course. He was obviously a little drunk, but drunk middle-aged men who golf was the norm for tourists, so I took no heed. He came up to the counter and I heard him ask if there were any gay bars in town, I told him no, but the closest one I was aware of was in Provincetown. A gay hotspot which was an optimistic hour drive away with traffic. He then asked me if I was interested in fooling around with him. I replied no, 
and in an attempt to soften the rejection, I joked. But I don't think my girlfriend would be too happy about that, which seemed to excite the guy as he redoubled his efforts. His big pitch was that he had an especially nice van that we could pull into the garage bay to use. Granted, it looked like a nice van, but it didn't sway my stance. After another five minutes, he seemed to resign to his fate and he left the store. I thought we were done and I went back to reading. Half an hour later, I hear a car start up and leave the lot. I didn't realize he just stayed in his van and was waiting for me. I figured, creepy, but whatever, he's gone, so I put it out of my mind. A couple hours after that, I was closing up shop. I had to go out on a ladder to change the prices on the sign for the next day. The town is deserted at this point, and all the lights at the station were off, save a couple in the garage. While I'm up on the ladder, the same van screeches back into the lot. I'm up on a ladder, in the dark, alone, not really thrilled about this development. He hopped out and hollered, I forgot to pay you. I figured that I'd given him smokes or something and just forgot to charge him as I was rejecting his advances. So I asked him, for what? He replied, I forgot to try and pay you for a good time. I paused. He yelled, $250. It occurred to me that I could probably just take the guy's money and run, but I correctly assessed that that would be really stupid. So I yelled, fuck man. No means no. Still on the ladder. He yelled, Jesus Christ, fine, and peeled out. I never saw him again, thankfully. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late, and last week I was doing some laundry at around 11pm-ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in a dryer, and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there with no clothes to watch, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. So I'm about 5 foot 4 with very long red hair and I'm half Indian English with Afghanistani descent. So I'm white passing, but kind of exotic, but people tend to stare at me. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal, then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here, and I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was Saudi Arabian and only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I say I have a boyfriend and he says, I only want you. And continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. And he wanted a hug. He asked me if I lived alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a bit more to gather evidence so I could take it to the reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked up my stuff. I ran back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I said it's okay, I'll just lock my door. 
It's about 1am and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I ask my friend if he's outside my room and he said no, so I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped and whoever it was went away. In the morning I reported this to reception and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend then after went to London to visit a friend. And last night was the first time I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been sexually harassed. One guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into here. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. I just keep blaming myself for being too nice, and I know it's my long thick hair that attracts people's eyes to me. I just want to cut it all off. Has anyone else had a similar experience? How did you deal with it? Oh, and reception still hasn't updated me on if he's still in the building. I'm just going to include several experiences I had while delivering pizza for a popular chain a long time ago. I live in a small rural town in the southeast US and it has the usual suburban developments as well as some more outlying country in rural areas. When I was younger, just as I'd moved out on my own, I worked as a pizza delivery guy. These are some of the creepy encounters I had during this time. Story 1 the orgy. One afternoon, I got a delivery order for an area of town I rarely, if ever, visited. It was on the east side of town, which was very run down and poor. An old textile mill used to employ many in that area, but it had been closed for some time and been overrun with kudzu and had begun falling apart. The houses around this area often had failing foundations and were very old rusty trailer homes. This particular order was to one of the trailer homes. I knocked and no one answered. I tried again for several minutes as I could hear music coming from the inside and I figured maybe they couldn't hear me. When they finally opened the door, it was a skinny guy with no shirt on and he asked me to step inside. When I walked in, there was a lady behind him who was wearing a robe and another sketchy couple standing at the back of the room. They had a boombox playing loud country music. These people were high and drunk, which I was used to, but this place was buzzing with crazy. All of them were at least 10 years older than me, and as I sat the pizza down and waited for payment, they started making sexual comments regarding my body. Whenever one would say something, another would encourage them to continue. Eventually, the guy who opened the door walked over to me and the lady behind him said, Go ahead and pay the man. He handed me the cash and put his free hand on my arm and in a hot breath of full natural light, he whispered in my ear and asked, We're all about to have sex. Do you want to join us? I said, No thanks and made a beeline for the door. And story number two, the creeper. I got two orders from the same area of town I talked about before. One was a 20 pie order for a church fellowship hall, and the other a single pie for a residence. I dropped the pies for the church off first, then headed over to the last customer. When I arrived, I immediately noticed the house looking off-putting, dark and dirty. I was like, Please let this be the wrong house. But it wasn't. There was a creepy, old, naked doll on the porch, and an empty birdcage hung from one of the trees in the side yard. I got out, grabbed the pizza, and slowly walked up to the house. I tried the doorbell, which was glowing, so I figured it worked. No one answered, so I tried knocking. Again, nothing. 
Eventually I got creeped out, so I started walking back to my car. Halfway to my car I heard, psst, and turned around to see an old man with wild and unkempt hair, literally peeking his head out from the back of the house. It was getting dark out, and my patience was draining, so I was not in the mood for someone playing games. I simply said, did you order this pizza, and waited for him to answer but he ducked back out of sight. I started to just turn to leave, but then he peeked out again. I said, Sir, is this your pizza or not? And finally he emerges. He walks up to me carrying a shovel of all things. He said, Yeah man, sorry, I'm just messing. I don't mean nothing by it. To which I just responded with the total and held the pizza out. Luckily, that was the end of the transaction, and I was able to get out of there. I worked the same job for a few years, and had plenty more weird experiences, but I then moved on to find something better and safer. If you work delivering items to people at their homes, stay safe, and never go inside their house. This happened pretty much an hour ago. I was pulling up to my house with my mom when she says, Who is at our house? Me, being confused, looks at our yard. Then I see someone walking up to us. My mom said he was trying to open the door and get in. Hey, I just lost my job. I was looking for somewhere to work. Could you help? The guy asks. I can't remember what my mom said but it was basically no because of what he's about to ask. Could you spare a couple of dollars? He asks. Sure, if you want to come to this side, I can give you a couple of bucks, my mom says. Thank you, he replied. My mom gives him some money. They then start to talk about how he should take it as a blessing and to pass it to someone else. He says my mom is an angel. Then they start to talk about other things I can't remember. Then the man disappears. My mom starts to drive around to find the man to make sure he's left, as she understandably doesn't feel safe getting out. We start to drive around. She calls her boyfriend and my dad. Then there's a cop car on the side of the road. Hey, there was a middle-aged man on my doorstep with the screen door open. Then he walked up to my car and asked for work this late at night, which I found suspicious. He asked for money, and I gave him some, my mom told the cop. Where do you live? The cop replied. My mom told him, and the cop said they'd follow. We drive back home with the cop following. He inspects the front and backyard, but there's no one. We decided it's safe to go back in. I talked to my mom about it, and she said he could have just been drunk and at the wrong house, since it was St. Patrick's Day and that people like to get drunk on that day. But I highly doubt that, as I find it weird that as soon as he saw us pulling up, he came to our car with a sob story. Take this information as you will, though. I was 22 and living on my own for the first time when this happened. It was the mid-90s. I had just gotten off of work around 11pm. To reach my apartment building, I could either walk on the sidewalk or cut across this communal garden. I saved about a whole minute of walking time by cutting through the communal garden, but being young and stupid, a lot of times I took the shortcut. That night, I got that weird feeling to not take the shortcut. I kept the sidewalk, but there's no one else around. When I got past the garden, all of a sudden, this large man pops up from its exit path. There was no way he could have been in front of me or just standing behind me as I was walking. I would have noticed him. The only logical explanation was that he'd been hiding in the pitch black garden. A drunk who had been sleeping it off. No. My body was screaming at me to get the hell out of there. I begin walking faster, 
My dad had taught me to always carry my keys in my fist with a key pointed out in case I needed to punch someone, so I had done that. But I'm 5'4 and probably weighed 110 pounds. This guy was tall and big. My only chance was to outpace him. I'm speed walking at this point and I feel him matching my pace getting closer. He's breathing heavily. I feel this angry energy coming off of him. But my apartment building is right there, so I put on a burst of speed. When I reach the entrance, two people are leaving and hold the door for me. And him too. I don't know why I didn't tell them I thought this guy was following me. My mind froze and I was just trying to get inside my apartment. Plus, I was still trying to rationalize it. Maybe he was visiting someone in the building. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. Don't be paranoid. Besides, it took only a couple of seconds for them to be out the door. I had missed my chance. I'm climbing the stairs as fast as I can. It's a three-story building and I live on the third floor. He's climbing the stairs too, still right behind me. I get to my floor which has four apartments on the right side where I live and four on the left. I pass by apartments one and two. He's still right behind me. I stop at apartment three where I live and he stops in front of apartment 4, where I know he doesn't live. He hasn't said anything, just breathing hard, and I think there's no way I'm gonna open my apartment door and have him push me inside and assault me or worse. He also hasn't knocked on the door of apartment 4. It's worth noting that the apartments are U-shaped, with mine and my neighbor's door being very close together so I bang on my own apartment door as loud as I can, but I yell my neighbor's name. Hey, Kevin, let me in. This startles the guy, even more so when my own apartment door doesn't open, but Kevin's does. Kevin sees the guy standing right in front of his door and asks what he wants. The guy starts mumbling something about the wrong apartment, but I have my own door open so fast that I'm inside my place in a flash locking the door behind me. I grab my cordless phone to call the police, but I hear Kevin through the door, telling this guy he needs to leave. The guy does. Kevin knocks on my door, asks if I'm okay. I thank him and say that I am, but inside I'm still frozen, adrenaline pumping and scared. I thank him again and tell him to have a good night, and I lock my door again. I have my phone in my hand, ready to call the police, but I start trying to rationalize it again. What exactly happened? A guy followed me home, but then he said he had the wrong apartment. Are the cops going to care about something minor like that? I try to calm myself down, but I'm also berating myself. Why didn't I run the instant I felt him following me? Why didn't I tell the people we passed when the front door opened that I thought I was being chased? Worse, why didn't I tell Kevin that the second he opened his door and saved me? He could have let me inside his apartment and we could have called the cops together. But because of my stupidity, everything felt so ambiguous and I was questioning myself. A couple of weeks later, I'm visiting my grandparents and my grandfather is reading the paper. He tells me that a woman was assaulted in the apartment building across the street from mine. It's the same guy. He had multiple convictions for sexual assault and had recently been released on parole. When I was about 8 to 9 in the early 2000s and you could still freely play in your neighborhood and always have a kid available to play with, there was this one kid, about 12 to 13, who would always fuck with me and my friends, even though we never did shit to him. My house was in the suburbs, and my street was a huge circle, so my friends and I would always roller skate, ride our bikes, or push our fake baby strollers around. Just normal shit kids do. This kid would ride his bike and stop in front of us, and we would say, Can you please let us pass by? And he legit said, 
Not until you ask nicely and say please. So we again said, please can you let us go by? And he eventually moved out of the way. He would do this kind of stuff often. And after a couple of years, one of my closest friends and I that experienced it the most got sick of it. We talked about how we would politely and nicely ask him to please stop messing with us. We thought about it for a good couple of hours before going outside to play, knowing we would run into him at some point during the day. Sure enough, we weren't even outside for five minutes until he used his bike to block our path on the sidewalk. So we, of course, ask him nicely to please stop messing with us, especially because we'd never been mean to him and don't understand his hostility towards us. The kid straight up says, Okay, let me go talk to my sister real quick. She was around 15, so we stayed where we were and were proud of ourselves for finally sticking up for ourselves in a mature and kind way. We watch as he goes up to their door and she all of a sudden starts cussing us out and saying she's going to beat our asses. So naturally, we were like, what the fuck, and hauled ass back to my friend's house on our bikes. About 15 minutes later, we hear a knock on my friend's door, and this psycho-ass kid said we punched him in the face, cussed him out, and threatened to kick his ass. We were so confused and had to basically beg our parents to believe us and realize that this kid had been the one screwing with us, not the other way around. Eventually, he didn't come outside as much, but when he did, he would just stare at us with his creepy-ass look, so we'd ride our bikes extra fast any time we were near his house. So, scary-ass kid that used to stalk and harass us, let's not meet again. Here we go. This is my darkest call for help. Before becoming an EMT, I was a team leader for a lifeline service. In the UK, these can be linked to smoke alarms. A call came through for a smoke alarm activation in a house roughly about five minutes away from our call center. All I could hear initially was the beeping of the smoke alarm. It was distorted because it was so loud. In the background, I heard a faint but panicked call for help and what sounded like the service user desperately asking for water. I obviously called the fire service. I kept the call open and listened as a roaring sound gradually got louder and louder. I then could hear a cracking and popping sound, probably the windows. I'm not fully sure what I heard then, but it sounded like the man faintly screaming and making gurgling sounds. After several minutes of listening to this and repeating instructions for him to get outside, I could hear respirators and the beeping of the fire service's radios. At this point, I decided to leave the call center being run by my colleagues and drive to this house. I thought they must have rescued him, but I was in denial about what I actually heard. Once I arrived, the fire service told me that they still hadn't found anyone. About an hour later, I was informed that they'd found a body. This man was a wheelchair user. He was found right next to his wheelchair by the back door, locked inside the house. I had to go to a coroner's court to explain my involvement. This is where I learned he was a smoker who regularly lit his cigarettes with matches. He also used paraffin-based cream for his skin. It was believed he had lit a cigarette dropped a match under his knees and accidentally set fire to himself. He had to be identified using his dental records. The cries for help and the noises of gurgling and screaming still haunt me to this day. I'm not sure if it was him gurgling or just something else making a similar sound, but I can't get the image of what it looked like out of my head. This was about three years ago now. I will never let myself forget this man. He taught me that you should never get emotionally invested in an incident. I've seen and dealt with equally as nasty a situation as an EMT, but thanks to this gentleman, I can let go of the emotional baggage that comes with ambulance work. This was painful to write.
This happened last week, and while she didn't seem malicious, the things she said were creepy. I was going home from university, and to get home, I have to use the train. As I got on, a lot of the seats were occupied. In my country, the seats are put in a way so that four people can talk and sit in front of each other, and they're kind of close, perfect for talking, even with strangers, sadly. I see that there's a free space in front of this girl, who's one or two years younger than me, but you can never know. I go there and ask her if I can sit down. Of course, she replied, and looked at me in a strange, intense way. I pulled out my phone to distract myself from her. She also had a chocolate in her hand. Keep that in mind. She asked me, where do you live? And I was like, why do you have to know? So she asked when I'm going to get off the train. I told her the place, and she told me that she's getting off at the next one. She started singing, then said, Oh, sometimes I sing. I'm a silly girl. Then did it again. Whenever she said something, she looked at me like she was waiting for a response. So I replied, It's okay to be silly, because I just didn't want to talk to her. Then she told me that, You are pretty. And when I asked what, she asked if she's pretty. In my language, the second one is an extension of the first, so it seemed like she corrected herself. Then she asked if she had chocolate on her face. She did. I also had the chocolate in her hand offered to me, but I declined. She also told me about her piercing that came off, and she put it on in the middle of the train. I told her that she should fix it when she got off, and she said, in Germany, will you go there with me? But obviously, I told her no. While she tried to put her piercing back in her mouth, she told me that she's in love with me. I told her that I have a girlfriend. I didn't. And that the pacing is too fast for me. And she told me that she will beat my girlfriend. Her I love you started escalating into, I'll kidnap you. And strip for me. She asked me if I will go with her and if she could go home with me. Then, when the train arrived at my destination, she asked me, Are you going, love? I told her yes and went on my way. Luckily, she didn't follow me home. She also asked me when we were going to meet again, and hopefully, that's never... I was around eight when we moved into an old house slash shop combination. The bottom is a commercial building with a big open room, a kitchen, and two medium-sized rooms connected to each other, and one connected to the open room. Upstairs is the living space. The layout of the bottom is fairly important. Also, the kitchen leads to the stairs, but you cannot see the kitchen from the open room. So we moved in, and from the start, I despised the place. I got bad, horrible, dare I say, energy from the place, and I don't tend to get that. In the open room, there was a large painting with a strange representation of what would seem to be a rapture event, a burning cross on top of a large Bible, a church with a crowd surrounding it, and a river on fire. Every time I would walk by this painting, my stomach sank horribly. Imagine watching someone you love die. We got rid of this painting very soon after we left, but the energy from that spot remained. The previous owners were an older couple, but the husband had died about five years before we moved in, leaving the lady as a widow. She was... strange. They had lived there for two decades, and she was so emotionless. Obviously this could be grief, but it was five years ago that he died. She was extremely emotionless as if she was dead in the body of a living person. She had this look in her eyes, as if she'd seen unimaginable things. Anyways, we moved in nonetheless, and there were already problems. Everywhere you were upstairs, you would be watched by something, but always watched. There was a mirror in the front of the stairs that I swear was cursed. I could not look in that thing without having a panic attack. My room went dark. I literally couldn't go into. My body restricted me. 
Now the lady that lived there did not clean the place. There were, strangely, piles of flies everywhere. They seemed like they were an offering of some sort, the way they were laid out, in a perfect mound. Now into the actual events. There actually weren't many, but the few that did happen were major. For one, soon after we moved in, my aunt came over. My aunt is more like my older sister, long story. Anyways, soon after she left, she told me at a family gathering that when she was there, she saw a four-legged creature that had the face of a human, but long stretched hind legs and long teeth. You might think she was trying to scare me, but she isn't the type, I promise. Then we took a photo, of nothing important but a photo. This photo had a face in it, a humanoid face that was completely pale white with pitch black eyes and no hair. The structure was an oval, not a human head, like a stretched oval. Anyways, the next day my mom and I went down to the cellar. The cellar door was next to the spot that had a large painting in it. When we went into the cellar, the door locked behind us. The door's lock had two steps that couldn't be done by accident. It was a chain with a little latch you see everywhere. When we closed the door, the chain was down near the floor, nowhere near the latch. This happened when me and my mom were home alone, with no one able to let us out for hours. We were trapped in there for a while. This was the last straw for us, and we decided to move out. To start, my mom has two dogs. One is a pit and lab mix, and the other is an Australian shepherd mix. They like to frequently get out. It's primarily her pit lab. His name is Big. If I remember, the previous owner named him that because of Biggie Smalls, and the Australian shepherd is named Luna. They're sweet dogs. Wouldn't hurt a soul unless they had to, I'm sure. But like I said... They frequently get out of the house and like to run around the property. Big is the only one that actually gets out. He's broken windows, window screens, chewed through doors even. He's got a lot of anxiety issues when it comes to being in the house alone and Luna simply follows him. He's medicated and goes through some training and it's definitely not as bad as it used to be but it's still a problem and my mom has had the police called on her for the issue once or twice. My mom has always been scared that he's going to get shot because she lives in a place hunters frequently visit and pit bulls have this stigma around them. She's also scared for the same thing with Luna because she has really long legs. She's scared that someone might mistake her for a deer. Luna is a fine dog on her own and rarely runs off if she doesn't have a leash on. She's mostly a follower. Anyways, the next bit of this is from my mom's account and also my mom's neighbor, Erica. She usually calls my mom if the dogs get out, and since they know her, they have no issues going to her personally. However, when they got out the other day, my mom was able to wrangle them up with Erica's help. But then later that night, my mom had gotten a call from Erica saying the dogs were out again. My mom was confused because they were both at the foot of her bed asleep. My mom even sent her a photo of them together on the bed. Erica ended up calling my mom about it, thinking it was a joke, but it wasn't a joke, and my mom was being honest with her. Erica sent a photo back to my mom, and one of the dogs looked exactly like Big. He has a very specific mark above his nose that looks like a wonky T-shape, and the photo looked exactly like Big, from the mark to even the demeanor from afar, and everyone was really freaked out. There was even a point where my mom thought Erica was joking, and she could do nothing but reassure my mom that it was not a joke. Erica made the absolutely worst decision she could, in my opinion, and decided to open her front door, and according to her, the imposter dog gave her the most evil look a dog could possibly give. She said the dog growled at her and showed their teeth. My mom even heard it over the phone. This prompted my mom to get on her golf cart and race over to Erica's house to see the dog herself. And there he was, barking at Erica's door after she went inside. It was also a dumb decision on my mom's part, 
but after the encounter firsthand, she raced home and called me crying about the ordeal, which is very unlike her. Apparently, another neighbor, Dean, called the cops because he saw Luna out and was terrorizing his chickens. The rest of the story is from me and what I experienced. I lived an hour away from my mom, so I hop in my car and get to her house. Three or four cop cars were parked down this rural street in the middle of bumfuck Ohio. It was a bizarre thing to see, honestly. When I walked up, cops were questioning my mom about her dogs with Erica, and the other cops I'm assuming were looking around the area for these dogs. I could hear my mom's dogs whining through the front door at the commotion. They were even looking through the window, too. Clearly not vicious or anything, and the cops concluded eventually that it wasn't my mom's dogs. They left eventually, and when I went to take Luna out on a leash, I made sure to stay with her and double check myself that nothing was out there that could hurt her. But when I looked into the back fields of my mom's house, I saw them. Two dogs that looked almost exactly like Luna and Big, standing side by side, staring at me not moving at all. Their tails weren't wagging, and needless to say, I was freaked out. Luna saw them and freaked out. I've never seen her react that way. I mean, teeth out, fur up, and all that. Seriously, I've never seen her act like that. I was even afraid to go near her out of fear she might hurt me, but eventually she walked towards me, growling and baring her teeth. She let me unhook her and take her inside. She didn't leave the back door for the rest of the night. It was like she was waiting for something to happen. They stood there for a really long time. It had to have been a few minutes because my mom called the cops and reported it. Some were still in the area, but eventually they walked off. Admittedly, I don't know a lot about dogs, and even though I've been around these two for years, I know for a fact. They weren't acting like dogs. The way they stared at me, the way they stood so still with no emotion from what I could tell, it scared the hell out of me. It's been a few days and they still haven't found the dogs. Dean is still unconvinced that it wasn't my parents' dogs. I stayed with my mom for a day or two to comfort her. I believe in Wendigos, I believe in skinwalkers and the paranormal, but I've never truly experienced it myself. But if it's anything like this, I don't want to experience this ever again. I've never experienced anything weird on my parents' property until this. I know skinwalkers will take their prey and use their corpse or whatever to try and lure people to meet a deadly fate. But her dogs are alive and well, and those things had tails. So in my opinion, skinwalker is not much in the question. It's just weird that two dogs that look exactly like my mom's dogs are standing side by side in a field. But maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it was just two vicious dogs that happened to look like my mom's dogs, one with the same unique mark. Or maybe it was something else. I was about 15 and was in Costa Rica for the summer, as I have a lot of family out there. It's a big family, and most of them live in the city, but we had this house in the deep country a few kilometers outside a tiny town called San Pedro. It was mountainous with thick jungle forests, a serene place really, an old little house with some hand-constructed pools and decks up the hill. There was power and water, and it was enough for a relaxing getaway. It was up the mountains, surrounded by jungle and some random ranch land and farmland. It was honestly the most beautiful place I've ever been, but given its isolation, it could end up being a little creepy, especially after dark. You'd see lights in the forest where there shouldn't have been, and sometimes you would see weird shit in the sky. When under the tree canopy, it got dark fast, and all kinds of things would come out and make noise. Noise in the jungle at night is honestly pretty normal, but one particular night, we had a weird one. 
It was myself, my abuela, my tia and tío, and my cousin. We were all settled in bed, reading as we didn't have any internet out there and smartphones were a new thing. It was actually almost dead quiet that night, more of an anomaly really. It was a sudden scream that broke the silence, and not just any scream. It was somewhat human and absolutely blood-curdling, like a woman mixed with a cat, vile and terrifying. It started pretty much right outside the house and traveled all the way up to the pool area, a good distance, still very loud. Meanwhile, as it moved up somewhat quickly, there was this thunderous sound of what sounded like a dozen horses in full gallop, moving with the screaming thing. It got up past the pool into a field behind it all the way up to the river. A good minute of horror. Needless to say, we were all shaken up a good bit. My little cousin, who was like ten or something, was unable to sleep again that night. Oddly enough, once everything had settled down, the jungle carried on like usual, bugs chittering and whatnot. The following morning, we went to look, and sure enough, tons of hoof prints. A local farmer said his horses escaped, but that doesn't explain the screaming. My abuela told me it must have been La Bruja, or a witch. People out there believe in such legends, elves and fairies. But you know, in a remote jungle or countryside, who knows what lies within? Anyway, that's my little tale. I went on a planned trek with a big group of 30 people in the Himalayas. The routine was to pack breakfast, hike the whole day to the next camp by sundown, and at sundown, have a campfire and go to bed early. No lights other than your own torchlights at night. As we gained altitude, the camps were fenced with a watchtower. I assume this was due to militants, as the army was manning the watchtower. That was the first time in my life I watched galaxies with my naked eye. I used to get very cold at night, so once the fire was out, everyone was to their tents. I had a bad stomach and had to relieve myself, so I woke up a friend and asked him to accompany me while I did my business in the woods. We were strictly advised not to leave the fenced area, but the guy manning the watchtower was so deep asleep, we didn't try to wake him up. We couldn't. He was comfortable in his thick layer of blankets, and I had to go. So we get out of the main gate. There's no lock, just the chain wrapped around it. I do my business next to a glacier that's come sliding down, all the while admiring the stars and chatting with my friend. After finishing and walking back to our tents, and are admiring the view of the night sky, a whistle goes out. We think it's a warning to get into our tents and sleep, so we do so. Someone comes around and checks our tents and leaves. Fast forward to the morning, a big assembly is called. There are more army personnel and they're all very pissed. We're wondering what the commotion's about. It turns out that there was a bear in the compound last night and someone left the gates open. There were footprints all around the tent. The army guys wanted to know who stepped out last night and who left the main gate open. The guy on the watchtower got a heavy telling off from his superior. We were scared and didn't own up to it. This has been a secret between me and my friend to this day. I still don't have any fear of bears, but it was so close to a real disaster. This story happened recently, and for some context, me and my friends are teens that like to explore and do stupid stuff like normal teenagers do. We found this tunnel that was a drain under a busy road. We had to crouch and sit on our skateboards to explore it, since the height of the tunnel was short. As we were going deeper into the tunnel, it gets pitch black and the flashlights from our phones can only reach about five feet in front of us. So we were blind to what we could come across until we were very close to it. 
in the tunnel, I remember the wall was painted in all red and had sheets of metal with white handprints connected to clothespins. We decided to keep going until we reached what we thought was a dead end. It was not. On the left was a more square tunnel compared to the rectangle shape we were in. In the distance of the connected tunnel, there was a bright light coming from the outside, shining from above onto a red shopping cart with belongings in it. We slowly inched towards the light where the shopping cart was. The light turned out to be a big hole in the ground that we could crawl out of if we needed an escape. As we were about to pass the shopping cart, my friend who was in the lead was too afraid to go forward anymore. It was pitch black five feet from where we were. I decided to take the lead and keep going. I stepped past the shopping cart and stopped. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. I had a gut feeling something was back there. I slowly moved back. I stopped. I swear I saw something move from the deep dark of the tunnel. Before I could put everything together, a loud echo of someone pounding an object on the walls of the tunnel struck me back causing everybody to freak out and crawl out of the escape hole. Once we got out, a homeless man ran to us asking what we were doing in there. We told him we were just exploring. He explained to us that there's a man that lives underground in that tunnel, and he would have killed us if we went further. The man was apparently crazy and threw a rock at the poor guy's head before. Luckily nobody was hurt. But even though it was scary and dangerous, it was fun, and I'm glad I experienced it. I work a really late shift at my job at Taco Bell. I don't get off until midnight. Just a couple of days ago, when my shift was over and I was heading home, I noticed two guys walking the same way I was. They were in front of me for some time, so I wasn't worried, and I guess it helped that I carry mace and a knife with me everywhere I go. At some point, when I looked up from whatever game I was playing on my phone, the guys were gone. I didn't think anything of it, as I just assumed that the guys turned off somewhere and I continued making the 45 minute walk back home. After a few minutes of noticing the guys were gone, I heard footsteps behind me. I glanced behind and noticed it was one of the guys I saw earlier, but it was just him. I don't know where the other guy was. I immediately knew something was wrong with this, so I picked up my pace and put my phone away, and I grabbed the mace from my pocket. I did my best to keep cool and not let him know I was aware of the situation but I was freaking out internally. I kept walking in the direction of my home, but I wasn't intending on going home and letting him know where I lived. I knew that a couple of blocks ahead of me was a 7-Eleven, and I knew one of the guys working there, as he's a friend of the family and lives in my neighborhood. As soon as I saw the gas station, I turned and quickly walked up to the doors, with the guy still following me. I've never had to use my mace or knife ever, and I was still hoping to not have to. I walked inside the gas station and was thankful the guy I knew was working. I walked up to him and quickly informed him of what was going on. He let me chill in the store with him until he got off of work. That guy stayed outside of the gas station the entire time I was in there, but he never went in. I'm so thankful my friend was working that night and he was able to give me a ride home. I don't know what I would have done if he wasn't. This was about 20 years ago, and I still think about this creeper from time to time. I was working the overnight shift at a local gas station and part of the overnight shift was building the Sunday newspapers. The paper company would deliver stacks of the different sections, and we'd have to assemble the papers and put them out for sale. We had a little nook set up in the back corner of the store where we would do this. You could clearly see the door from the spot, and we didn't get a lot of traffic in the middle of the night. We had two panic buttons in the store. 
one mounted under the counter and a portable one that I always carried in my apron pocket. One evening, I'm back in the nook and a guy walks in and straight back to me. He's very tall, thin and pale. He's dressed all in black, including a full length black trench coat. He asks me if I've seen anything strange tonight. I'm thinking that he's the strangest thing that I've seen in a while. I replied no and asked him if there was anything that I could help him with. He then went on a rant about how he is on a mission from God to wipe out all the demons that are walking amongst men. He can see people's true forms, and that's why he carries this for protection. As I'm simultaneously shitting myself and pressing my pocket panic button, this wacko pulls a cross out of his pocket. It had to be seven inches long. He then hollers that God is calling and runs out the door. A few seconds later, the cops show up and I fill them in. They drove up and down the stretch of road that we were on and didn't find anyone on foot. They came back and told me to keep my button close and they check on me periodically. That was one of the longest nights of my life and I quit shortly after. You see a lot of crazy working the night shift, but that guy was a whole lot of crazy that I didn't want to meet again. My mom was a single parent, and as such, she worked almost constantly and was nearly always tired. Due to that, she was not the most present parent. Despite being only two years older than my sister, I was headstrong and insisted on acting as the man of the family, putting on a tough face and powering through things, like comforting my sister when she had a nightmare so we didn't wake up mom. This happened while we were on a shopping trip, I'd say I was about seven, making my sister Alice about five. She was a talkative child, always requiring someone's attention, and yet neither mom or I noticed that she disappeared until we reached the checkout. Thinking she'd simply gotten distracted and wandered off, mom wasn't too concerned and I volunteered to go get her. I walked past the aisles, peeking my head down each to try and spot her dark, curly hair and pink jumper when I heard muffled crying and a woman trying to shush someone. Rounding the corner to investigate, I saw something chilling. A woman crouched down, desperately trying to quiet my crying sister with her hands vice-like on her wrist. Seeing me, the woman put on a smile and tried to shoo me away. Don't worry, she just had a little fall. I vividly remember little seven-year-old me straightening up puffing my chest to look as tough as possible, and with a glare I spat out. That's my sister. Her smile dropped and she let go of Alice. I grabbed her and ran back to the front where my mom was waiting outside. She didn't seem too concerned about the lady, despite the nail marks on my sister's arm, and we just went home. I'm 21 now, so shopping child grabber, for your sake, let's not meet again. This all started because my mom needed a few things from Walmart, and I was going there anyway, so I decided to save her the trouble and get the stuff for her. I get what I need and check out. I walked outside and realized I parked on the other side of the store so I started walking. I had an uneasy feeling, but I pushed it away by saying it was just my social anxiety kicking in. Okay, so I get to the row I'm parked on, and I'm closing in on my car when I notice these two guys walking behind me. I thought nothing of it because the Walmart was packed when I went in, so I just ignored them until I realized they weren't stopping. They were following me all the way back to my car. To put it in perspective, I parked on the very end away from everybody else, so I wouldn't get my car door smacked in. They stopped a few feet from the spot beside me and watched me get in the car. I stood there for a minute, but walked away when they saw me pull my phone out. 
I called my dad, shaking and explaining everything to him. He stayed on the phone with me until I calmed down enough to drive home. And you might be saying, well that's not bad, but it gets worse. I'm still on the phone with my dad, trying to calm down when I noticed they came back, but this time they're in their car. They slowly drive by my car, and the one in the passenger seat looks at me with a creepy smile and waves at me in a flirty way, and then they drove off. Let's just say I didn't leave that parking lot for a while. I felt sick, kind of like the flu. I felt completely fine in the morning, but it got worse as the day went on. It was the middle of the night, and I was up with my husband and our new six-week-old baby. I was pumping breast milk. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to EMTs surrounding me on my bed, telling me not to move or sit up. My heart rate was incredibly high, and my blood pressure was incredibly low. They took me to the hospital, and no one knew what was wrong with me for a while. They kept asking me what drugs I took. I kept telling them nothing, which was true. I had just had a baby. The biggest drug I was taking was Tylenol. They didn't believe me for a while. I couldn't remember a lot of things at this point. I could barely even remember my own kid's name. I couldn't tell them who the president was or what year it was when they asked. It was a weird feeling to have memory missing, kind of like having lost some puzzle pieces. Talking was also kind of difficult. After a bunch of tests, it turns out I had a UTI so bad that I went into septic shock and my kidneys were shutting down. I didn't know I had a UTI because I was still healing from childbirth, and I am pretty asymptomatic when it comes to UTIs. I spent a few days in the ICCU, it was extra scary considering my brand new baby was at home and I wasn't, and there was a chance I wouldn't make it home at all. In the end, I thankfully made a full recovery. It's not as intense as some other people's stories. Sepsis is no joke. So I would say that maybe on average, once a month I get this strange feeling that everything around me is fake or staged. It's pretty difficult to describe. It almost feels like I'm on a movie set or something similar, but not quite. I've been getting this feeling since at least middle school. It's kind of similar to the feeling you get when you experience deja vu, except without the feeling of re-experiencing something if that makes any sense. It's more of a sensory thing than anything else, like how the lights hit certain things, or the ambient sounds, or a feeling in the air. Everything just seems off. It can be extremely unsettling at times, but it usually doesn't bother me at all. At first, it used to really freak me out, but now I just write it off as my mind playing tricks on me, and I don't actually think anything strange is going on. It usually happens at night or early a.m. before the sunrise, but occasionally happens during the day too. It mostly happens when I'm outside, but it does sometimes happen when I'm inside too. It usually only happens for a short amount of time, like from a minute to an hour max. Does anyone else get these feelings? Does anyone know why I get this weird feeling? Am I just crazy or what? It doesn't really affect my life in any real way. It just kind of throws me off for the whole day when it happens. I spent my childhood in a village between the countryside and the city. It was a quiet place, like any small village one perceives during childhood. The case I'm going to talk about is not terrifying, but it is mysterious. There is a man who often prowls along the farm, the bookstore not far away from my mother's house, and the metro stations. 
He's not dangerous. He's even a nice person, but almost everyone makes fun of him and thinks he's crazy. I don't really know much about him, but I do know this. His name is Elaine. He's a man who was in the Vietnam War. I saw him again not too long ago while shopping with my mother. He greeted us and came to tell us that he'd seen aliens. He always whistles friendly western film music on the way while he walks. Always seeming cheerful, but very lonely. I don't even know where he lives. He's the kind of man who tells you that one day he's a grandmaster black belt in karate, and then another day he's going to act in a cowboy movie that he was a close friend of Bruce Lee and other things. Most disturbing is his obsession with aliens and fairies, but when you talk to him, you get used to it. I've known him for many years and he hasn't changed. He's someone who hasn't aged physically. It's very disturbing. He says he traveled back in time. When my son was two years old, he started acting as if he was interacting with something or someone that his father and I could never see, like throwing toys down the hallway and then running away murmuring words. When I asked what he was doing, he always told me that he was giving toys to the boy for him to play with. There was never anybody there, but it was always icy cold leading into the garage. I'd asked him what the boy's name was, and he would tell me. Don was his name. I always asked what the boy was doing, waiting for his mom to pick him up. He would always reply. We put it down to an imaginary friend and nothing more. Harmless, we thought, until he started waking up in the middle of the night, screaming, saying, Don won't let me sleep. He keeps tickling my toes. This sent chills down my spine, and so my son would sleep in my bed with me every night. This continued for another six months, until the real estate notified us that the owner of the house had died and his children would be selling the property and splitting the profit between them, meaning we had to move. After we left, I came across a local news article about the owner of our old rental, stating how much he will be missed by the community. He had been raised by his mother in the house we were renting since he was a child. Then I noticed his name and everything came flooding back to me. His name was Don. My son's imaginary friend was our homeowner. He must have been waiting for his mother to come and take him to the other side. I'll never look at imaginary friends the same. I was shopping at a grocery store. I was in the drink aisle reaching for something when I suddenly got a bad feeling. I turned my head to look back and jumped when a man who was extremely close to me, like an inch behind me, quickly moved past me. My knee-jerk reaction was to reach for my back pocket to make sure my car key was still there, and it was. So I brushed it off, thinking maybe it was someone in a hurry who perhaps almost ran into me absent-mindedly. As I finished grabbing my drinks, I glanced at him. He stopped a few feet from me, hands behind his back, casually walking back and forth looking at drinks. He did not have a cart or a basket, but maybe he was just grabbing some drinks and didn't need one. I moved on to another aisle, and after I reached to grab something and turn around, there he is again, except this time a few feet from me. Again, hands behind his back, looking at items in the aisle. Spooked at this point, I went to check out. As I'm in line, I look behind me and don't see him. Good, I'm in the clear. I turn my head back around and bam, there he is on my left, looking at something near the checkout line. There are several different checkout lines, as well as a self-checkout, so the odds of him being there coincidentally seemed low. He still did not have a cart or any items. Not knowing what else to do, I just stare directly at him until he notices me. He immediately walks off and I don't see him again. Considering how close he got, 
I think he was trying to steal from me. I was probably seen as an easy target because I was alone with a purse. Either that, or I just stared down some innocent, poor soul. When I was 17, me and one of my friends applied for a work experience program in the UK in a town near Brighton. We'd already done so the year before that, and kind of like the whole homestay with a family slash work in a pub formula. At the time, we were constantly looking for weed, and in the first days, had very little luck finding some. So on about the fifth day, after having dinner by ourselves, we went for a walk in the city center near the piers of the little town. While walking down the avenue adjacent to the beach, which was also relatively crowded, we saw two young guys in their 30s smoking cigarettes by an alley and tried our luck. As soon as we asked for some weed, the two of them looked at each other and smirked. One of the two pulled out their phone and made an obvious fake call to a friend asking whether he had some weed without even waiting a second for an answer before hanging up. At that point, they started circling around us and pointed to the end of the alley, saying their friend would be meeting all of us there and that he was also a bit of a funny guy. As if the whole thing wasn't enough, this last sentence triggered our instinct. We quickly turned them down and walked away. The next day at dinner, we had a conversation with the family we were staying at, and after a while, the mother brought up how in the last two years, the town saw a spike in abductions of both children and teens. I have no idea if what we were about to experience would have been a standard mugging or something more sinister, but probably due to my age, it was carved into my memory. We were at a sportsman warehouse in Colorado with our parents. I was 14 and my little brother was 12. We were on a trip to see family, so we were about done walking around and decided to sit down in the camping chair aisle while we were waiting for our parents to be done shopping. While we were sitting there, a lady that looked cracked up on some sort of drug walked up to us and started asking us weird questions. She asked us, where is Colorado River? Can you show me on the map in the front where the Colorado River is? There was a map of the US in the front of the store right by the entrance. She kept telling us to walk up there with her because she needed help finding the Colorado River on it. We both were weirded out and started to walk around to find our parents. She kept following us and didn't stop. We found our parents and I told them what had happened. My mom started to yell at the lady but she wasn't going away even after that. We checked out and started leaving the store. When we walked out, we saw the creepy lady and three or four men run out of the store and near a van that was hidden out of any camera view. Two of the men were waiting outside of the store, and that's when I realized what was happening. The lady wanted my brother to go out to the front of the store so that the two men could abduct him and run to the van. I'm so glad we followed our instinct and didn't follow the lady. To this day, I'm very cautious when I go into town, especially because I live on the border of Mexico and Arizona. Don't talk to strangers, even if you are an adult. You never know how many people are in on the abduction. My son fell asleep on the couch around noon, and I thought, perfect, I'll go nap too. About an hour or so later, I woke up to him crying. This in itself is pretty unusual, since he's a very happy little boy, but I comforted him, and he clung to me like he never wanted to let go. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I untangled myself and turned on Donald Duck for him to watch. He was happy and snuggly like usual and some time went by. I was laying on the couch with him, just reading stories about possessions on Reddit when he gets up. 
You walk toward the kitchen through the hallway when he suddenly stops, turns around and looks at me. Eyes locked, he slides one finger across his throat in the very well-known gesture. He doesn't make a sound, nor does he have any expression on his face. A few seconds pass and he turns around and walks into the kitchen. About 30 seconds later, he comes walking into the living room and seems to be his happy self again. A couple of days ago, his mother was watching him here. She wrote me a message on Messenger that a door opened by itself, and she felt something or someone touch her. I definitely believe her. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here, but I ignore it to the extent that it almost becomes ridiculous. I have many spooky stories to tell, but this actually freaked me out enough to acknowledge it. He's just three years old. This happened to me and my girlfriend I was dating back in the summer of 2014. This all took place in South Carolina, and my girlfriend and I wanted to take a camping trip. We initially tried to go to a place 45 miles from our hometown, but they were going to charge us double what we thought we were going to pay for. We decided to head back, and it just occurred to me that there's a spot very close to where we live. Now I will say it's more boondocking and off-grid. We didn't have to pay for anything, we just parked the car and got out. This place is quite gorgeous. There's a historic bridge and trail, also some of the oldest railroad tracks in the south. We got there before sunset, so we had plenty of time to pitch the tent and set everything up. There were a few cars when we arrived, but they were mostly hikers and would be gone before nightfall. The only thing that made us uncomfortable was a busted up and rusted old white van with no license plate. We both pointed that out, thinking it was weird, but we shrugged it off and started walking to a good place to set up camp. After several hours, around 3am, following some quality time spent with my girlfriend and taking in all the nature and then going to sleep, we started hearing this obscure singing and walking around our tent. Any time you hear commotion that early in the morning, nothing good can come from it. I peered my head out of the tent to see what was going on. I didn't see anything or anyone, but nonetheless, I didn't want to stay in that area when we both were freaked out. Just because I couldn't see them doesn't mean it's not there. I barely did a decent walk around our tent. As we were quietly gathering our belongings, we swore we heard the singing get louder. I recall words in this song he was singing had, Now won't y'all come out, followed by this raspy laughing. Once we finally packed the tent, that was when the crunching on the leaves and his humming began. We knew this guy was close by now. We booked it. I grabbed my girlfriend's hand and threw the tent and folding chairs on my back. We made sure to run the opposite way from where all the noise was coming from. Luckily we set up camp fairly close to the parking lot because I could see the lights through the trees. As we ran and scurried away from whoever was chasing us, we noticed the lights from the parking lot weren't just the street lights, but also to our horror, it was that old, rusty white van we saw in the beginning. We hurried uphill, just hoping this guy was alone. If he had an accomplice, that would be another person to deal with. As we reached the lot, we got into the bright street lights, and I noticed my girlfriend's hand make a slight twitch, and her pace slowed down. From what I could tell, she was turning her head to take a look at her attacker. I heard her gasp loudly. Come on, don't look, we're almost there. She focused back and we continued running in unison. The guy was getting closer as I could hear the footsteps on the gravel intensify. I heard his wheezing and him barking. Don't y'all think you'll get away? As we just made it past the van, we split, and I handed her the keys so she could unlock and start the car, and I can throw all the gear into the trunk and we can make it out of this place. As I frantically laid the camping gear in the back seat and head over to the driver's side, that was when my body faced forward for the first time in a while. Every noise this guy was making was close and amplified now. With the car running, I kept my head down and put it in reverse. 
but curiosity got the better of me. In the brightness of my headlights, this man was a behemoth with a stern wrinkled face with patchy red hair, a goatee that had dirt and crud smeared all over it. His eyes were fixated on us like a scope, magnifying on two ten-point bucks. He was wanting to kill. Get back here, he barked, waving a baseball bat back and forth. I shook my head, and with that I swerved out, and we were on our way out with our hearts racing. In the rearview mirror, we saw the man slam the bat in frustration, a narrow escape. We drove to Waffle House and stayed there until sunrise. I live in a little suburban area on the outskirts of a city. My apartment is on the ground floor and faces into a cul-de-sac with a car park. Recently, I've been hearing a lot of cat-related kerfuffle from the area. I didn't think much of it at first. There are plenty of cats, pets, and strays in the area. They fight, they screw, all that stuff. I'm well used to the kinds of unearthly noises cats can make. They can be pretty freaky, especially when you wake up in the darkest hours of pre-dawn to them. Anyway, I'd been hearing this one particular cat, I thought, for several days, and it always sounded like it was coming from the car park. I know we, as humans, tend to anthropomorphize these things, but it was a sad little cry. After a while, I started to think that maybe this was a pet that was lost or hurt. Maybe it had been beaten up by one of the big strays in the area. The old heartstrings started to pull every time I heard it, but I couldn't spot the little guy anywhere. I thought about trying to put out some tin fish or something, but there are so many other cats that I had no guarantee that this one would benefit from it. The next time I heard it, I decided to go take a more thorough look. It was about 10 p.m. and it was freezing cold, but out I went into the car park, looking around the bins and checking under cars. The cat stopped crying as soon as I opened the door, but I guess it must have heard a person and clammed up out of fear. I got about halfway across the space, when a street light, right at the center of the cul-de-sac, the only one that lights up the space, went out. No. That's pretty weird. The street light isn't motion activated or anything. It's time to come on at night and turn off during the day. It stays on all night. I've never seen it randomly turn off before. Alright, weird electrical fault. I turn back to my apartment. Fortunately, the motion activated light above my door that turned on when I stepped out is still aglow so it's not like I've been plunged into total darkness. Except that one turns off too, pretty much as soon as I turn around. Heh, <laughs> what a coincidence of timing, I say to myself, trying to ignore the growing sense of unease. What do I have to be nervous of? I'm standing in a car park in a cul-de-sac, not the middle of the woods or something, but it's surprisingly dark out there without those lights. Fine. I'll just trigger my light again by moving around, and the damn thing wakes me up all the time because it's too sensitive. It picks up cars and people as soon as they enter the cul-de-sac, except now, it's not working. I wave my arms, move closer, nothing triggers it. Two weird electrical faults in a row. Not impossible, right? But I can't help but feel creeped out by it. Now the cat, that's been silent since I stepped outside, starts crying again. Except it's not just one cat, the crying is coming from several places at once, and started almost at the same time. There've gotta be at least three or four different cats, 
screaming loud from different parts of the car park. I can't see any of them. It's just their weird alien voices. Enough is enough. I go back into my apartment. I'm not going out to investigate if I hear it again. It's not a paranormal event for sure, just a series of creepy coincidences. But still, it weirded me out. Hope you enjoyed that guys. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad free videos as well as other behind the scenes content. Thank you to Vicky Howell, Gloria, Ashley Juster, Celsa Rundle, Merciful Humming, Carol Zaffirano, Melissa Moore, Dixie Busby, Michelle Green, Misty Rakur, Michelle Brooks, Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindo, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Yennefer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Ballard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mayers, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Matt is a Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, 
Holly Sprung, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitex, Heather Hapen, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absent Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one. Like I've been saying in previous posts, being part of the medical community has afforded me the chance to evaluate patterns in all stages of life of people, including patterns that we see at the end of life. Some of you that work in hospitals or have loved ones that work in hospitals or have been close to loved ones as they took their last breath and transitioned to the great unknown may have heard of what I am about to describe. There is a particular phenomenon that occurs to people in those last moments, and I'm talking about the appearance of kids running around their deathbed or just outside of their room. This is to be differentiated to the phenomenon of close ones that have passed away visiting in days prior to their deaths. This is different. This occurs hours, if not minutes, before their deaths. I experience this with greater frequency whenever I work in the ICU unit where people are very sick. What most patients describe is cheerful kids running about around their beds in a playful manner, snickering or playing. Most patients usually respond calling the nurse and asking, who are these kids running around and where are their parents, and scaring the living bejesus out of them if they are new nurses. If they are experienced nurses, they know the time of the end is soon to come, and they communicate promptly with us doctors to let us know to be ready. Literature often chalks this phenomenon up to lack of oxygen in the brain or neurochemical changes in the process of death and dying, but the pattern is very recognizable, and the experience is very similar across all cultural backgrounds and ages. Almost all hospitals have a story about these, kids, and if you are entering the field of medicine, nursing, or any other health allied profession, you will certainly hear these stories. So if you're doing rounds in the ICU late at night and hear some snickering or tiny feet running in the hallways, prepare, because the call of Code Green or Code Red is about to sound off in the PA system. <laughs> 